The current downturn is unique in that it is attributable to the virus and the steps taken to limit its fallout. This time, high inflation was not a problem. There was no economy-threatening bubble to pop and no unsustainable boom to bust. The virus is the cause, not the usual suspects. The virus is the cause, not the usual suspects. The virus, 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 not the usual suspects. Virus, not the usual suspects. The virus is the cause, not the usual suspects. 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 Well, there you have it. The chairman of the Federal Reserve just said that this so-called little downturn, this depression we're having, is unique. Blame everything on the virus. I want to finish this clip off so that you can hear him formally declare open season on Main Street, which is the purpose of this speech. The virus is the cause, not the usual suspects. Something worth keeping in mind as we respond. Okay, now think about what he just said. The virus is the cause, not the usual suspects. And keep that in mind as we respond to this, meaning we're going to pack $3 trillion in our balance sheet. That's the virus's fault. Your pension got destroyed? Blame the virus. Your house got seized under eminent domain because some of the rotted assets we bought on our balance sheet died and fell off and now have to be replaced? Talk to the virus. It's amazing how dangerous what he's saying is. And by the way, did you see that little gulp he had there at the end? It looks like Mr. Corporate himself, once he hears the script in his own voice, is having trouble swallowing that script. It's actually quite Shakespearean. Let's roll this clip again so you can see this and pay attention to the gulp at the very end. The virus is the cause, not the usual suspects. Something worth keeping in mind as we respond. Allow me to translate. You are now on notice that we are going to steal everything not nailed down and blame it all on the virus. Yeah, well, since the criminals aren't content to rob us of our livelihoods and are now going to steal all our assets as well, I thought now might be a good time to discuss one of the least understood mechanisms of theft in the Federal Reserve engine of larceny. The, and that mechanism is reserves. And no, this is not another lecture about the 10 to 1 reserve requirement or how banks are lending out 10 times as much in loans that they have in capital. Nothing like that. That is actually part of the con job that is reserves. Now to get into this and to tell you what reserves are really about, I want to discuss how a wire transfer actually works. So I've got a wire example, a wire transfer example here. And in our example, you have an account at bank A and I have an account at bank B. And what we want to do is transfer $100 from you over to me. Now, if you're like me, you imagine that a wire transfer goes something like this. Your account at bank A is big. I have a smaller account at bank B. A wire is run between our accounts. The wire is activated and the transfer of $100 takes place, leaving your account minus $100 and my account plus $100. The problem is that this model does not even remotely reflect actually what is going on in a wire transfer. So let's back up and go to square one and try this again with a realistic model of how a wire transfer actually takes place. The reality is that there are actually two separate circuits in the monetary world. You and I deal in bank money shown here above the dotted line, and our accounts are in bright green there. That's bank money. But commercial banks do not transact. They don't, they don't transact business in bank money. Commercial banks transact business in reserve money, shown here below the dotted line in dark green. And this is where the actual wire transfer takes place. There are three steps in a wire transfer. The first step takes place above the line in your account, where $100 of bank money gets deleted. That's step number one. The second step takes place below the line and is where the actual transaction takes place, where reserve money is transferred from your bank to my bank in the amount of $100, and that's key. Step three takes place back above the line in my account, where $100 of bank money 
uh, is simply added to my account and voila, that is how the wire transfer is effected in those three steps. Okay, that is how a wire transfer actually works. It takes place in three steps. And if you understand how a wire transfer works, you are well on your way to understanding how the theft mechanism of reserves works. Now, let's unpack a few things first, though, before we move on. First thing is that this money up here, the bank money that you and I transact in, all of that money is created out of thin air and lent out at interest by commercial banks. I did a video on that called Mommy, Where Does Money Come From? And that explains how that, that whole process of the creation of money out of thin air. Now down here, this is reserve money by the Federal Reserve. This money is created out of thin air too and let out at interest. But this money down here is created by the Federal Reserve. So the process is the same as simply two different entities. Now there's a lot of overlap because the commercial banks in large part own the regional Federal Reserves that are operating down here, but they're two separate entities. And in fact, that brings me to another point. There are two separate monetary circuits here. The bank money circuit and the reserve circuit are two totally different monetary circuits. You don't have an account at the Federal Reserve, and I don't have an account at the Federal Reserve. So those are two different uh, monetary circuits. The next thing to notice is that what the Federal Reserve is doing down here is accommodating what is going on in the real world. You want to transfer money to me, uh, we do that. The Federal Reserve actually does that transfer down here um, in reserve money. And that's how that works. So it's accommodating the action in the real world on the one hand. On the other hand, the Federal Reserve down here is controlling what goes on. The wire transfer takes, down, takes place down here. The Federal Reserve down here, it decides who has membership in the Federal Reserve system, you know, who gets a wire, it sets the rules, it sets the interest rates. So at the same time the Federal Reserve is accommodating what is going on in the bank money world, it is also, to a large degree, controlling uh, what is going on in that world. The final thing to notice is that there is a dollar for dollar correspondence between bank money being transferred in the wire transfer and reserve money being transferred, which is where, which is where the actual transfer takes place. Notice that it's not $10 being transferred down here. The reserve requirement, the 10% reserve requirement, that has nothing to do with it. Again, the reserve requirement for the most part is just, it's simply a chew toy to get people to bite onto that and, and get all angry about that and growl and snarl so that they don't, they don't, they might miss the fact that all of this money, the, both the bank money up here and the reserve money down here, is created out of thin air and lent out at interest by private banks. The commercial banks up here doing it are banks like J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, all those. And the Federal Reserve Bank's doing it down here are simply the regional Federal Reserve Banks, principally um, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. That's really the wire transfer. Now, let's be honest. If you were like me even just a little bit, you are going to forget all of that in about 10 minutes flat. And that's a problem when the theft that's going to take place is probably going to occur over the next 18 months or so. So what we need really is a model of the monetary system that is both accurate and memorable, and that's the key thing, so that we have an accurate and memorable model in mind when the theft takes place so that we can track it in real time. Now, how do we do that? Well, now I have a confession. And the confession is that when Powell said, don't look at the usual suspects, it's all the virus, the very first thing I did was I looked at the usual suspects, and I watched the whole thing again. And you know what I found? Yeah, an accurate and memorable model of the monetary system. And it's actually uncanny, this film, because what makes the usual suspects completely accurate as a monetary model is actually a flaw in the film. And I don't mean like a continuity error or a boom mic dipping down into the scene. I mean a bona fide logical error with a script which is an Academy Award winning script. The script is internally inconsistent as a result of the flaw, but it's that flaw that makes it perfect as a monetary model. So, if you have not seen The Usual Suspects, now is the time. It is a great film. If you want to rewatch it, now is the time because I am going to spoil the film 
six ways from Sunday when we get into the discussion of how it models a monetary system. So now's the time. No? Cool. Let's get right into it. In its most basic form, the usual suspect is simply a whodunit. It is set in present-day California, in San Pedro, where the previous night there has been a horrible gunfight and a fire on a boat in a harbor, and something like 30 men are dead. And now we have the investigation the next day into what really happened there. So the film is really driven by, and, and, and our narrator in the film is Agent Kulyan, played by Chaz Palminteri, and he has just flown in from New York. And the reason he's there isn't so much for the massacre itself. He's not so much interested in that as he is why a gang of thieves was on that boat in the first place. And in particular, he is after a guy named Dean Keaton. He has been investigating Keaton for years and years and years. He's never, never been able to pin anything on him. Um, and now he wants to know what happened on that boat since Keaton was part of that New York gang. Chaz Palminteri has a big problem, though. Keaton is dead. In fact, pretty much everybody on the boat is dead except for two survivors, one of whom is this guy. He's from the New York gang, too. That is a guy named Roger Kent, affectionately known as Verbal. He is played, as you can see, by, by Kevin Spacey, and he is just a con man. He's, he's crippled, and he is going to match wits with uh, Agent Kulyan here as Kulyan tries to discover what happened on that boat. And Kent's thing, Verbal, his, his nickname is Verbal, Verbal is going to fight um, Agent Kulyan tooth and nail because Verbal does not want to be a rat. And so what happens in this scene here is the line in the sand between them is drawn uh, very definitively. First thing on the job, you know what I learned? How to spot a murderer. Let's say you arrest three guys for the same killing. You put them all in jail overnight. The next morning, whoever's sleeping is your man. You see, if you're guilty, you know you're caught. You get some rest. You let your guard down. You follow me? No. Let me get right to the point. I'm smarter than you. And I'm going to find out what I want to know. And I'm going to get it from you whether you like it or not. I'm not a rat. Thanks. What Kuyan doesn't know, and what we the viewers don't know, because Kuyan is our guide, is that he is being played like a cheap ukulele. Verbal Kent is a master storyteller, as it turns out, who can and does spin characters out of whole cloth. He simply makes them up to suit his purposes as the story goes on. And in his next scene, he's going to make up a character called Kip Diskin. Now, to be clear, we, the viewer, do not know that Kip Diskin is a wholesale fabrication until the end of the movie. And the reason we don't know is that Verbal is so good as a storyteller, he's a con man after all, that he's able to do this very convincingly. That guy is tense. Tension is a killer. I used to be in a barbershop quartet in Skokie, Illinois. The baritone was this guy named Kip Diskin. Big fat guy, I mean like orca fat. He was so stressed in the morning. Not only is Verbal able to create characters out of thin air, he's able to sell them too, and that's key. And the way he sells them is through misdirection. He gets Kuyan to focus on his position of weakness, his Verbal's position of weakness. And you don't even notice as the character gets slipped into the narrative. In this scene we're going to watch here, he's, try, he's so desperate to get Dean Keaton to join him on a job that we don't even notice that he slipped a new character into the narrative. New York's finest taxi service. Bullshit. Bullshit. They don't operate anymore. McManus has a friend in the 14th precinct. They're coming out for one job Thursday. They're picking up a guy smuggling emeralds out of South America. McManus already has a fence set to take the stuff. A fence who? Some guy in California, his name is Redfoot. I never heard of him. You have to come. What's it to you whether I do it or not? They don't, they don't know me, you do. They won't take me unless you go. Look at me, I need this. Look, oh, you're telling me you don't need this? Is this your place? Look, I'm not knocking you. You look like you got a good little scam going with this lawyer. <coughs> oh! <gasps> <sighs> Sorry. Now, Redfoot happens to be a completely credible character simply due to his role. The gang has stolen a bunch of jewels from New York. They need cash for the jewels. They need a fence. 
defense is Redfoot. He's in California. We know the gang came out to California anyway. So Redfoot's uh, simply a credible character just by, just by virtue of his role. But as clutch as he is to the action, he pales in comparison to Verbal's next creation. The next creation is a character named Kobayashi. Now Kobayashi is the guy who puts the gang onto the boat where most of them end up getting killed. Kobayashi supposedly brings the gang a job where the job is there's going to be a dope deal. All you guys do, all the gang needs to do, is step in and steal the money for the dope deal. And it's a lot of money. It's $91 million. And that is what ultimately ends up getting the gang killed, or most of them. Everybody except for Verbal, as it turns out. Now, again, Verbal is able to sell this character to Kuyan through his position of weakness. Watch this scene. You don't think I know you held out on the DA? What did you leave out of that testimony? I could be on the phone to Ruby Deemer in 10 minutes. The DA gave me immunity. Not from me. You get no immunity from me, you piece of shit. Every criminal I have put in prison, every cop that owes me a favor, every creeping scumbag that walks the street for a living will know the name of Verbal Kint. Now you talk to me, or that precious immunity they seem so fit to grant you won't be worth the paper the contract put out on your life is printed on. There was a lawyer. Kobayashi. Is he the one that killed Keaton? No, but I'm sure Keaton is dead. Convince me. Kobayashi is the last character that Verbal makes up. He's also the biggest character that Verbal makes up. But he is not the biggest character in the film. The biggest character, of course, is Kaiser Soze. But Kaiser Soze, unlike the rest of them, is very, very real. Now, how do we know that? Well, for one thing, he's vouched for independently of Verbal Kent outside of the San Pedro police station office. And he's vouched for by the only other survivor of the boat fire, a Hungarian man burned half to death in this scene right here. He needs guarantees. Hey, what is he talking about? Guarantees. He, 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 life's in danger. Sembel, sembel, uh, he saw the devil, looked him in the eye. I'm on my way. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Ask him to tell him what he told me uh, about the devil. Who's the devil? Okay, is there the Kitlata. Kaiser Scherze. Latum, Evot Lento. Kikatebe, Udio Kot Minde. Kaiser Soze. He was in the harbor killing many men. He saw Kaiser Soze. Latum as art sat. With Latum Minde. Latum as a man, and Miko Betu Kom Mustan. He saw his face. All right, all right, look, get him. Tell him to tell her what he looks like. As fate would have it, of course, it's only after Kuyan lets Verbal go that he discovers the horrifying truth, which is that Verbal has been running a con on him the entire time, and a con on us, the viewers. And that the whole time Verbal was supposedly telling him what went on in the harbor, he was, in fact, making up a story. And he was doing so by picking and choosing elements off a police station bulletin board and weaving them into his story for the purpose of concealing his own horrifying identity as Kaiser Soze himself, and that Verbal Kent is nothing but an alias, and that discovery by Kuyan occurs in this scene right here. Barbershop Quartet, Skokie, Illinois. Where's your head, Agent Kuyan? What we need to do is think. Think back. I'm sure you've heard many tall tales. Bricks Marlin. This isn't right. I just want to Tell hear every last detail. It's all there. And I'm telling it straight, I swear. <sighs> Some guy in California, his name is Redfoot. A gift from Mr. Soze. Talk to me, Verbal. What about Redfoot? Mr. Redfoot knew nothing. Using pawns. A big, fat guy. I mean, like orca fat. There was a lawyer. Kind of Myths and legends of Kobayashi. Sir. I've never seen again. So back when I was picking man. beans in Guatemala, we used to make fresh coffee. I know you thought he was a good man. I know he was good. And tell me every last detail. The strangest thing. How do you shoot the devil in the back? This altar is protected from up on high by the prince. And tell me every last detail. What about detail. a pretzel, man? What's your story? There was a lawyer. What lawyer, Verbal? I am Mr. Kobayashi. 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 
Tell me every last detail. I work for Kaiser Soze. Convince me. Convince me. Convince me. Okay, I'm not going to play the whole scene, but basically the FBI agent there, a very young-looking Giancarlo Esposito, is looking down at a fax machine, and what he sees is the sketch artist rendition from the hospital, her rendition of Kaiser Soze, which of course looks exactly like Verbal Kent and Kevin Spacey, and that in a nutshell is the entire film. Now, what I want to do is I want to diagram the story structure of The Usual Suspects and show you how it models the monetary system basically to perfection. So, what we have here is the world according to The Usual Suspects. There are two realms of characters in The Usual Suspects depending on where they come from. The first realm comes from real moms in the real world. And they have, these characters are flesh and blood characters. They are very real. I've got them in flesh color tones here. And we can call this half of the, of the movie, which is really most of the characters, let's call this the regular world. But that is not the only world or the only realm of The Usual Suspects. Obviously, there is another realm of characters, and these are in a separate space altogether, and they are coming from Verbal Kent in the police station office. And these characters are, of course, completely fictitious, and they are coming, obviously, as I said, from Verbal Kent. The purpose of Verbal's fictitious characters, of course, is to control Agent Kulian, to keep him from discovering the truth. But to do their job, to effect that control, Verbal's characters have to be very believable. They have to accommodate reality. Verbal can't have Redfoot, for example, you know, give the stolen jewels from New York to his favorite charity. That's simply not believable. He's got to accommodate reality. And that's really true of any con. The, to control the person being conned, you have to accommodate reality and sell them on reality. And that is what is going on here. In this pursuit, Verbal gives birth to three different characters. The first is Kip Diskin. And I've got Kip covered, colored gray here since he's not a flesh and blood character. He is simply an invention for Verbal Kent. He's basically just a thought. The second Verbal invention is the character of Redfoot. And the third, of course, is Kobayashi. And he is the one, Kobayashi, who was born on the bottom of the coffee cup. Now, Try as they might, Verbal's fictitious characters cannot cross over into the real world. Redfoot can't really flick his cigarette at McManus's eye because Redfoot is only a few neurons in Verbal's head. Everything that Redfoot supposedly does is just a big lie told by Verbal Kent. Redfoot is forever trapped in Verbal world. By the same token, the real world characters are forever trapped in reality and cannot cross over into verbal world. For one thing, a guy like Fenster is simply too big to physically crawl into Verbal's head so he can mix, mix it up with the fictitious Kip Diskin. Real world and verbal world are two separate realms. They do not overlap. Okay, now that we've modeled the story structure of the usual suspects, I want to show you how we can get an accurate model of the US monetary system simply by changing a few labels on our usual suspects model. Let's start with the title top and center. Instead of usual suspects world, we have US monetary system. Now let's go to the real world side of things on the right. Instead of regular world, we have regular bank accounts. Next, we just want to change the flesh colored dots here, since they're bank accounts, to a more appropriate color, say like green. Next up, we want to change real moms to commercial banks. I know that's blasphemous, but you know, it's a model. Now remember, in Mommy Where Does Money Come From, we learned that all of our bank money is created by commercial banks. If you haven't seen that video, check it out, and you'll learn that all the money in our bank accounts is ultimately a source from commercial banks, which create that money out of thin air when they make loans. Now let's move over to the left side or the other realm of the US monetary system. In monetary terms, that realm is not verbal Kent. 
It is instead the Federal Reserve System. There we go. And just like Verbal Kent created three different characters, we see the Federal Reserve creating three subclasses of money. First, we have reserves instead of Kip Diskin. Second, we have excess reserves instead of Redfoot. At this point, I want you to think back to our wire transfer example and remember the two functions performed by reserves because they're doing exactly the same thing here as the first two characters invented by Verbal Kent. Those reserves in the wire transfer both accommodated reality and a controlled reality. And that's exactly what happens here with the reserves and is exactly what happens with Verbal Kent's characters. But remember that Verbal created three characters. And just like Verbal created three different characters, the Fed's creating three subclasses of money and we've only accounted for two. The third Fed creation, of course, is King Cash. Cash in the monetary system is replacing Kobayashi in the usual suspects. Okay, just as the usual suspects real world characters on the right side can't fit into Kevin Spacey's head on the left side, bank money cannot jump over into the reserve circuit system. There are two realms of money and they are isolated and exclusive and thus Federal Reserve money cannot jump over into the bank money world. There is an obvious and very huge problem with this model, however, and it is cash there up on top. Cash most certainly can make the leap over into the bank money space and increase the size of anyone's bank account. So it looks at first blush like our usual suspects model has broken down, since cash can in fact move from the Federal Reserve realm into the bank money realm and it can go back and forth between the two. Whereas Kobayashi is a fictitious invention of Verbal Kent, and he is stuck and forever trapped in the fictional uh, Verbal Kent world where he cannot influence and cannot act in the real world. But here's the uncanny thing, and here's what is so uncanny and why the usual suspects is such a great model for the monetary world. There is a mistake in the film, and Kobayashi does in fact operate in the real world. Now, this is a very short scene where this happens, but it happens nonetheless. In this scene, Agent Kuyan has just found out about Kobayashi, but he is now outside of the police interrogation room or the office, and I want you to listen very carefully to the following conversation that takes place. His name was Arturo Marquez, a petty smuggler from Argentina. He was arrested last year in New York for trafficking. He escapes to California. They pick him up in Long Beach. They're setting up extradition. He escapes again. Now, get this. Edie Finneran's brought in to advise on the proceedings. Kobayashi. New York faxed me a copy of his testimony. It was a rat. Uh-oh. Did you catch that? Kobayashi supposedly had an attorney appear at a deposition of one of the smugglers on the boat. That's a real achievement for a character born on the bottom of a coffee cup. Not only that, they're talking about a deposition that took weeks ago, and Kobayashi was only born on the coffee cup about five minutes ago. So obviously there's a fundamental contradiction in the film. Now, if you watch this scene pretty carefully, you can see, let's just watch it again and see where it goes wrong. His name was Arturo Marquez, a petty smuggler from Argentina. He was arrested last year in New York for trafficking. He escapes to California. They pick him up in Long Beach. They're setting up extradition. He escapes again. Now, get this. Edie Finneran's brought in to advise on the proceedings. Kobayashi. Okay, the scene as it is right now is actually fine. Kuyan is speculating that Kobayashi is the one who put Edie Finneran into that deposition. So it's okay up until this point, so long as the other two law enforcers respond in a way that's consistent with Kobayashi being a fictitious alibi. The response might be something like, Kobayashi? Who in the Sam Hill is Kobayashi, Agent Kulian? Are you on drugs? You are a customs agent for crying out loud. Get out of my office and take the gimp with you. But that is not what they do. Let's watch. New York faxed me a copy of his testimony. It was a rat. Well, there you have it. Kobayashi occupies both spaces in The Usual Suspects. He is both the fictitious creation of Verbal Kent on the one hand, and on the other hand, as you just saw, he is a real world figure who has influence in the real world. Um, he is just like Cash, Kobayashi Cash, remember that. Likewise, reserves 
in the monetary world are like Redfoot, Redfoot Reserves. Reserves are forever trapped in reserve world space. They do not get into bank money space. They are trapped and isolated there. However, like we saw in the wire transfer example, reserves are at the same time they're accommodating reality. They are to some degree controlling reality. And next time I am going to get into an example of how reserves are being used to control and to manipulate uh, events in the real world. Until then, and in the meantime, if you want to read more on these subjects, and in particular about the split circuit monetary system, I highly recommend Sovereign Money by Joseph Huber, and in particular, I recommend you read chapter four. It contains a very nice discussion of the, of the split circuit monetary system. An even better resource for my thinking is Debt by Design by a guy named Joshua Marie. This book is easier to read than Sovereign Money. Uh, the it's divided into 28 chapters. They are all very short, very easy to follow, very informative, and even better, Joshua has become a very good friend of this channel. Um, we have had a Zoom session where he has walked me through some of the more arcane and some of the finer points of our very confusing and very tortuous monetary system, and he is a wonderful resource for this channel to have. I cannot recommend that book enough. Also, Joshua has a website. It is called fairmoney.info. You do not need to buy that book. That book is sold at cost. I think it's like $14. I like to have physical copies of my books. However, if you just want to download it from his website, fairmoney.info, you are free to do that, and it is dynamite. That website also contains a lot of documents, like the ones I like to use, the original source documentation, where you can see this guy's not making this stuff up. He's dead serious, and he knows what he is talking about. Great resource. Um, I encourage you to avail yourself of it. I'll leave links down in the description box below. That's all the time we have for now. I know it's been a long video. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much for watching, and I will see you next time.